part one. All right, so in this chapter, what we're going to be talking about are the different ways that we are able to learn. Um, based, this particular style is based off of behavioral <clears throat> um, psychology. And first and foremost, what I want you to uh, do is please make sure to um, read the read the chapter. And the reason I say that, not only are you going to need the uh, lectures, the PowerPoint slides, but you're also going to need to um, have a good understanding by reading the chapter itself. And it might take a couple of times because with learning, I can tell you that the rules of learning um, and conditioning can sometimes be confusing. And I can say that even as a psychologist, uh, it's, it's an area that I still overview and look over each and every time that I uh, have to teach this section. So with that being said, my disclaimer to you is don't get discouraged. If you appear, that it seems like it's foreign. Um, just like learning anything new, it'll take a time. The more practice you do at it, the more reading you do about it, the better you'll get. So, learning is a relatively permanent change, relatively permanent change within our behaviors or mental processes. And it's usually caused by our actions that we take or through experiences. Conditioning is a process. It's the ways that we do learning, and we do it through associating. Um, so it's those associating between stimuli along with what we're doing as far as our behavioral responses. Now, here's the thing, and this is what we tend to forget. What we learn it actually can be unlearned. Think about it. If you've taken geometry or you've taken courses that you really wasn't truly interested in, you might have learned a lot of information. However, that information kind of just gets filtered away if you don't use it on a continuous basis, repetitively. So what is learned can be unlearned, including riding a bike. We'll talk more about it. So let's start first with the conditioning, and we're going to talk about involuntary classical conditioning. Here's some key terms that I want you to make sure you're aware of. First one being classical conditioning, and this is the uh, process in which you learn through involuntary paired associations. So, and that usually happens when there's a neutral stimulus. Now, a neutral stimulus is pretty much a type of stimulus that you might not have to do anything uh, with in order to get a reaction. So, for an example, if I talk about a dog and a dog uh, salivating, they salivate because they see food. Food, in this case, would be the neutral stimulus. Now, classical conditioning will occur when that neutral stimulus, the food, would be paired with something that's an unconditioned stimulus, something that's not going to make the dog necessarily salivate. So, in terms of what we'll be talking about, if we took a bell or tone um, and we paired it with the food, at the exact same time, <clears throat> excuse me, when we're going to feed the dog, we present the food and the bell at the same time. So the dog sees the food, hears the bell. He salivates. That's when we condition, it was, it's going to um, elicit a conditioned response. Why is it conditioned? It's conditioned because of the pairing. So let's say I did this with my dog for three months straight. It wouldn't even take that long, but just threw the number out there. 
If I did this every day for three months straight, where I fed the dog and rang the bell, showed the dog the food, rang the bell at the exact same time, simultaneously, eventually, I don't have to show the dog the food for him to salivate anymore. Eventually, I just got to ring the bell. And what will happen? That dog will start salivating because he's going to think, what? I'm hungry. It's food time. He's going to be able to associate it. That's what classical conditioning is. This is something that would be considered involuntary type conditioning. Okay. <clears throat> So now, the unconditioned stimulus is an unlearned stimulus that would naturally and automatically elicit that unconditioned response without the previous conditioning. So, remember, the food started out as a neutral stimulus and it, it made the dog salivate. The salivation is considered that unconditioned <clears throat> response to the neutral stimulus which is now considered an unconditioned stimulus, okay? The unconditioned response, again, is that unlearned reaction. You didn't have to teach the dog to salivate. The dog already salivated when he saw the food. So there's no conditioning required to get the unconditioned response. Now, in terms of the neutral stimulus, this is something that's going to occur before any type of learning happens, before any conditioning occurs, okay? And it doesn't bring naturally about the response of interest. With the conditioned stimulus, this is now from that previous neutral stimulus that I paired the food and the bell. The bell is now considered the conditioned stimulus, okay? And again, remember I told you I showed the, the dog it for three months? Well, for those three months, that's what happened. I repeatedly paired the two items together, which created that conditioned stimulus, <clears throat> which is an unconditioned stimulus, now conditioned, all right? And what happens is it's going to create a conditioned response. The conditioned response is the salivating. He now, when I show him the bell, the bell is the conditioned stimulus, okay? So, he now will salivate from the bell, which is a conditioned response. Because prior to the pairing, he wasn't going to salivate at a bell. He only salivated at the bell because, um, because it was paired with the food originally. Another example, and I'm going to keep up with the dogs to kind of keep you on track, um, but my dog, Coco, I can't touch a bag, nothing, no type of plastic or paper bag. Why? Because every time I touch a bag, he thinks he's going to get a snack, okay? He comes and he sits, and he sits and he's waiting right in front of me. He will not move if he hears me with a bag. In that case, the bag is the <clears throat> is now that conditioned stimulus because he paired it with the treats that's inside it. The treats is what makes him alert and, and want to sit and ready to do anything. Okay, his conditioned response is to sit alert and stay there until he said to go eat. Hopefully that helps a little bit. Um, as we go further in. Um, I want you to also make sure you try to work out different scenarios for yourselves and practice this on your own. So, now we're going to go ahead and break it down a little further. Now, I use a dog. Oddly enough, Ivan Pavlov is a... Uh, this is this who was doing some experiments who used a dog and he used food and he used a, one of those toners, you know, doom. I said a bell, but he used a toner. Okay. Before Pavlov's dog learned to be able to salivate as something extraneous like the site of that experimenter, 
That original reflex the dog had was inborn and biological. Basically, it consisted of an unconditioned stimulus, the food, and then an unconditioned response, which was that salivation. So Pavlov's accidental discovery, which it was accidental because he wasn't trying to do that on purpose, but it made such a great contribution to psychology because it gave us an understanding about what learning is and how it occurs when a neutral stimulus which again that neutral stimulus is does not evoke or bring out any kind of different any kind of response on its own but when it's regularly paired with that unconditioned stimulus like the food we would get that conditioned stimulus and then a conditioned response so the originally neutral stimulus the tone or the cardboard box that's shown on the slide here uh, it becomes a conditioned stimulus which then will elicit and or produce a conditioned response. And remember, in this case, the conditioned response will be salivation. So let's bring it up and let's get rid of dogs for a minute. On this slide, it also shows you an example of how that happens to us. Think about the neutral stimulus. In this case, they're showing you a cardboard box. But what about if you're driving down a road and you see uh, the McDonald's arches, okay? Regularly speaking, that's not going to elicit a response like making your mouth water or salivate. But because it was paired with a Big Mac, every time you go, you eat a Big Mac. Guess what? When you see those arches, it gives you that same thought. Mmm, I could go for a Big Mac. My mouth watering. That's a modern way of looking at it, okay? Um, so again make sure you go over the slide the slide's pretty good it gives you a great explanation and a great breakdown and it allows you to be able to <clears throat> uh, make examples for yourself so that you're able to recall it in through conditioning yourself by presenting this material to you i would suggest that you also pair it with something that you like to do um something like maybe your favorite food or your favorite drink and you pair it pair it with the slide to remember see if that helps that every time now you see the slide it makes it's going to bring up that feeling and you're automatically going to remember everything let's try that so i'm going to move forward all right as mentioned there's a lot of terminology that you need to get yourself accustomed to and used to and one of the things, and this will probably be in your assignment <clears throat> for this week, but using the key terms within classical conditioning, I want you to be able to identify what's going to be the neutral stimulus, the unconditioned stimulus, the unconditioned response, what is the conditioned response, I mean stimulus and the conditioned response in these um, examples that you find below. So I'm not gonna talk about this no more. You can pause and read it, um, but this is something you more than likely will find in your assignment for you to complete, okay? Now, one way to help, <coughs> excuse me. So now one way to help uh, you to remember and be able to recall how to use classical conditioning is to work by the formula that you see on the slide okay it shows you how the neutral stimulus doesn't automatically uh, produce a response so in the formula you would write ns equals zero because that stimulus neutral stimulus wouldn't normally have anything happen but the unconditioned stimulus would produce an unconditioned response Remember, the unconditioned stimulus in this case would be food, okay? The food will automatically make it salivate. The conditioned stimulus is going to be producing a conditioned response after we've paired it with the neutral stimulus and an unconditioned stimulus. So, you see it, neutral stimulus plus unconditioned stimulus will equal conditioned response and that conditioned response, I mean stimulus, 
told you can get crazy when you're uh, trying to discuss it. But thankfully, it's on the slide, so I can correct myself, and you can see the correction right there without getting more confused. But the conditioned stimulus then will help to elicit a conditioned response. That's what I was supposed to say. Okay. Now, according to Pavlov's theory, what he did was he took the bell that I talked about, and in this case, the bell is a conditioned stimulus that was paired with meat powder, which was originally the unconditioned stimulus, okay? So, the bell originally started out as a neutral stimulus, which is not being said there, but... Let's put a little NS here to kind of help you to remember that the bell was a neutral stimulus, okay? After multiple pairings with meat powder, Pavlov was able to get salivation to occur, which was originally an unconditioned stimulus. But through the conditioning process and the conditioned stimulus now being presented, it creates that conditioned response. Okay? So, remember that in the line, it, this, this slide helps in a lot to help you to see it. Conditioning trials are the, these three lines here. And when we're talking about the thicker <clears throat> Excuse me, thicker arrow here. It's talking about that SNR connection. That SR connection is what was unlearned and more uh, innate within us, um, inherent. Uh, and then the small line that's right here represents what happens with the stimulus and the response connection after the conditioning has occurred. Okay? Now, <clears throat> Watson and Rayner's famous little Albert study. And if you want to know a whole lot, please make sure you read it within your text, but also go on YouTube because you can find a lot of videos on little Albert. Trust me. And then it'll give you a great understanding and idea about uh, Watson's contribution. You'll also probably be like, really? They did that? <laughs> but him and Rayner, what they did was when they worked with little Albert, it showed how fears actually originate through being conditioned, okay? The study they did, they took an 11 month old, excuse me one moment, they took an 11 month old child, okay, that we call little Albert today, and what they did was they allowed little Albert to uh, play with a little white lab rat right and like a lot of little um, babies Albert was showed a lot of curiosity and he would reach for the rat um, and he had no fear about the rat not at all so Watson he kind of knew that infants naturally would be more frightened by noise than by the animal itself so what Watson would do is Watson would stand behind Albert and he would allow Albert to start playing with the rat. But when Albert would reach for the rat, Watson, what he did was he took a big old steel bar and banged it up with a hammer. Okay? Now, what do you think happened? I know I, what I would do. Somebody did that behind my back. I'm going to jump. Right? That loud noise would frighten Albert. And it started making him cry. So what happened is the rat was being paired with the loud noise and it only took seven times. That's important for you to know. It only took seven times before Albert started showing fear of the rat, even if there was no noise around, okay? Even without the noise being done. So when we're talking about uh, classical conditional terms, we would probably say that the white rat, which was a neutral stimulus in this situation, got paired with the loud noise, which is that unconditioned stimulus. Because that unconditioned stimulus 
produce the conditioned emotional response. So not just a conditioned response, but just recall it as a conditioned emotional response. So much so that Albert started being afraid of the rat, okay? Now, the study, it helped us to learn that many of the things we like that we dislike, things that we might be prejudiced about, things that we're afraid of, they actually are forms of conditioned emotional response. Think about that, okay? Conditioned emotional response Now, there's processes that we have to look at that's complicated within classical conditioning. However, they'll help us kind of understand the fundamentals, the basic understanding of it, okay? So, the next four slides was going to help us to thoroughly explain the principles about classical conditioning, and there are six. So, when we're looking at acquisition, which is the first principle. Acquisition is looking at the neutral stimulus that's paired with an unconditioned stimulus, all right? And once it's paired, what happens? That neutral stimulus turns into the conditioned stimulus. That conditioned stimulus will now elicit a conditioned response, okay? So on the slide, you see the example that kind of helps you and again, we were talking about conditional emotional response. Here is showing you <clears throat> in terms of when we go to the dentist. Um, some people are afraid of the dentist. They're afraid of the pain that it caused. So there's been a pairing there, okay? So you may learn to fear, which is a conditioned response, the dentist office itself. The dentist office, which would have started as a neutral stimulus before you even got your teeth clean, and after you got your teeth clean and left, you was in a lot of pain. So that parent, each and every time you go to get your teeth clean, is painful. So after a while, that dentist office, when you see it coming close to it, it's not become that conditioned stimulus. Because you associate that response, which they're saying a reflexive response, to more of, a pain, of the pain, thinking about the cleanings and if you had to do root canal or if you had to have an extraction of tooth pull, that's going to be uh, what will elicit just seeing the office. It was going to flood you back with all those memories, making you afraid. Now, stimulus genera um, generalization. This happens more or less because we take the conditioned response that's, um, that ha occurred. Uh, it's not only going to be to just that conditioned stimulus, but it might also be to some type of stimuli that's similar or close to it and would be considered a conditioned stimulus as well. So for example, let me go back to little Albert. Remember, Watson used the white lab perhaps, right? However, after he did that, not only was Albert afraid of the white rat, um, lab rat, but he became afraid of white rabbits. So there's a generalization that's current occurring. So the same could hold true if we look at one dentist's office. You can go to another dentist's office and you're still gonna have that same fear come up because there's been a generalization that all dentist offices is painful. You're gonna do nothing but feel pain in any office you go to. And that's why a lot of us tend to ignore and avoid going to the dentist. Don't do that though. <laughs> okay, so moving on, let's talk about stimulus discrimination. Now, there's going to be some stimuli that can be close to the conditioned stimulus, but yet it still is not going to elicit a conditioned response. So we can tell the difference when we're talking about the dentist's office between the doctor's office. And because you really never had problems with the doctor's office, you're not going to have a stimulus generalization. So you're able to discriminate between the two. In terms of little Albert, little Albert, he couldn't take the white rabbits, but he loved brown monkeys. See what I mean? Furry animal, didn't, he wasn't afraid of. He was able to discriminate between the two. Now, 
The fourth principle is talking about extinction. This occurs when the condition stimulus, if it's presented by itself, without pairing it with the unconditional stimulus. Sooner or later, it's going to not have the same strength it had when we first paired it with the uh, conditioned stimulus, okay, unconditioned stimulus. So that unconditioned stimulus will no longer really elicit a conditioned response, okay? So let's go back to my dog. If I stop giving him food every time he hears the bag and I do that for a while, eventually he's going to stop coming and sitting up and waiting for a snack If because I haven't rewarded or given it to him, the snack. And I didn't pair that anymore with it. So what happens with extinction is basically it weakens. Okay, your condition stimulus weakens. You're not going to elicit that condition response like you used to. There are times, though, say a particular behavior did just go away because it uh, the condition stimulus wasn't paired with the um, with the unconditioned stimulus anymore. There is going to be times that out of the blue. It could have been three years later, I hadn't given my dog any snacks and I've been able to open bags and everything and he paid it no attention and all of a sudden out of the blue, he heard me open a bag and he comes to sit at attention. This is what we call spontaneous recovery. That's when there's a sudden reappearance out of the blue of a previously extinguished type of um, response, conditioned response. So, Finally, number five for this page, I mean, number six for this page of conditioning principles would be the high order conditioning. Now, high order conditioning occurs when the neutral stimulus is actually becoming a conditioned stimulus through that repeated pairing with a previously conditioned stimulus. So, let's say I started out with the food and I paired it with the bell. I then paired the bell with the bag. You see what I'm doing? It's, it's, that's that higher order. So now, because right now, if I had did that pairing with the bell and the food, right now that condition stimulus of the bell is much stronger, okay? Because I've been doing it repetitively, but I no longer need the food. I can show the dog, ring the bell, and the dog is going to automatically know he's hungry. Now, if I pair ringing the bell with opening a bag of food, what happens? We have higher order conditioning. A conditioning is going to occur again. So now the dog is not only going to get all happy and salivate at the sound of a bell, but at the sound of that plastic bag going too. Hopefully that makes sense for you. So I gave you a quick brief synopsis, but let's talk a little deeper about it, okay? Going back to principle number one. The process of acquisition is going to be happening during the initial phase of classical conditioning. And again, it's where a neutral stimulus that is going to be consistently followed up with an unconditioned stimulus, uh, becoming, it becomes a conditioned stimulus. And that will then elicit a conditioned response. So during that acquisition phase, the subject, let's say the dog, shows that increasing response to the stimulus that's going to <clears throat> that's going to be repeated over and over again through exposure, or if you were doing research through trials. Okay. Now effectiveness of classical conditioning. There are times when we have what we call delayed conditioning. And this is kind of forward in that the uh, neutral stimulus will appear just before the uh, unconditioned stimulus. And what happens is it's allowing the conditioned stimulus to proceed and overlap the presentation of the unconditioned stimulus. 
To think about it though, the optimal time uh, between the onset of the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus really will depend largely on the type of response you're trying to get. But usually the most effective interval will be about a half a second. Delay conditioning is considered to be the most efficient procedure for establishing a conditioned uh, response. Now trace conditioning is another way of forward conditioning and this includes presenting as well as stopping the uh, condition stimulus prior to uh, showing the unconditioned stimulus. When we're talking about trace conditioning, this is not going to produce a stronger uh, conditional response as would the regular presentation of the conditioned stimulus. And it do have some delayed conditioning occurring with it. Okay. When we're talking about simultaneous conditioning, <clears throat> here this is even less effective than uh, trace conditioning. And it'll happen uh, when you're showing as well as removing the conditioned stimulus and unconditioned stimulus simultaneously. Backward conditioning is involving the uh, unconditioned stimulus being uh, shown prior to the conditioned stimulus. And it's usually not going to produce the conditioned response. It's really kind of uh, ineffective and usually the stimuli is going to be more about how close that a particular stimuli might be. Um, but it tends to have mm, some weakness as well. Now, the number of conditioning trials, the greater the conditioning trials would be for the condition response. Remember, the more you practice, the more you work at it, the better you get, right? Same thing can hold true in this regard. However, regardless of the number of trials, that condition response will be weaker in intensity or magnitude than the unconditioned response. The unconditioned response, again, is involved to it's, it's it's not something that was created. It's um, something that's innate. So that's got a big, strong hold on it. So even though that dog may salivate at the sound of that bell, he salivates even more from seeing the food. Okay? When there's pre-exposure to the conditioned stimulus or an unconditioned stimulus, it's that repetitive exposure to the unconditioned stimulus that will help the conditioned stimulus before the conditioned stimulus and unconditioned stim uh, stimulus are paired, it kind of slows down the acquisition of a conditioned uh, response. We got to take a deep breath on that. Um, but I'm going to stop here actually uh, and end part one of our chapter six. Pick it up soon in chapter uh, of part two. Thanks.